The first thing is, is what is atrial fibrillation? As you know, the, the heart's divided into two parts, the top chamber called the atria and the bottom chamber called the ventricle. On the left-hand side of the slide uh, is a normal rhythm, and what happens is the top chamber beats and then the bottom chamber beats. What atrial fibrillation is, is, is demonstrated on the uh, right-hand side of the slide, where the top chamber, instead of squeezing normally, is sitting there quivering. With atrial fibrillation, the top chamber is actually beating at 350 to 400 beats a minute. Now, you don't feel the top chamber beating at 350 to 400. You feel the bottom chamber beating at 80, 90, 100, 110, 120, um, very irregularly. Um, if we were to look at the heart during open heart surgery with atrial fibrillation, it would be sitting there squiggling. It would actually look like a bag full of worms or snakes. Uh, instead of a nice rhythmic squeeze, it's just quivering. And that's what atrial fibrillation are, is. There are really four problems with atrial fibrillation. One is the rapid irregular heartbeat. So when you have atrial fibrillation, a lot of patients will say it feels like a fish flopping around in their chest. The second is it does increase your risk of stroke. Uh, it increases it by 5%. Um, there are certain risk factors that we'll talk about in a little bit that increases it further. Uh, but stroke is a devastating effect for atrial fibrillation and uh, it's something that with medical therapy uh, can be avoided. The third problem is, is the top chamber is supposed to act as a booster pump to push blood from the top to the bottom chamber. Uh, particularly in people with a thick bottom chamber, that booster pump is very important. It amounts to 5% of the pumping ability of the heart. It's like trying to run your car without its carburetor. Um, the final problem with atrial fibrillation is you can develop a weak heart muscle in the bottom chamber if you've got atrial fibrillation with a very rapid ventricular response. When we see people with atrial fibrillation, one of the things we'll frequently do is a 24-hour halter monitor, a 24-hour tape recording. And what we're doing on that 24-hour tape recording is see what the average 24-hour heart rate is. We want it to be less than 90 beats per minute. If it is less than 90, um, then usually the heart muscle is well preserved. Uh, the problem is, is when you're in the doctor's office and he gets that EKG and you're laying flat on the table, and your heart rate's 85, and he says, oh, your heart rate's well controlled, and you walk out to pay at the receptionist, and now walking down the hall hallway, your heart rate's 200 beats a minute. Um, that can cause a problem. It can cause the heart muscle to get weak, and it's very important if you have atrial fibrillation, and for whatever reason we've decided to leave you in atrial fibrillation, to make sure that the bottom chamber doesn't get weak. If it starts to get weak and we control the heart rate, um, with maneuvers we're going to talk about, the heart muscle can get strong again. But if it's been weak and been weak for a long period of time, then it tends not to come back. Now, atrial fibrillation is a huge problem. Um, here's a graph looking at the various abnormal heart rhythms that patients present with. And on the far left-hand side, that blue bar is atrial fibrillation. Over in the middle, three-quarters of the way over, is a yellow bar called ventricular fibrillation. That makes a lot more news and press where somebody suddenly keels over and they do CPR and they shock the heart and, and Hollywood's a lot more interested in that. But you know, it clearly gets a lot more news play than atrial fibrillation, but atrial fibrillation way outshadows it and any other arrhythmia known to mankind. Now there are lots of treatment options for atrial fibrillation. Here's a brief list. There's PRN treatment, which means um, you treat it as needed. There's blood thinning agents, rate control agents, rhythm control drugs, pacemakers to prevent AFib, pacemakers, and a procedure called an AV node ablation, pulmonary vein isolation, and surgical maze. Um, don't worry, there will not be a quiz after this. Um, <laughs> PRN treatment, what does it mean? Um, if you have atrial fibrillation and it occurs every 20 years and lasts for five minutes and spontaneously converts, um, I'm not sure we need to give any treatment for that. If it lasts longer, there are medications we can actually give you in what's called a pill-in-the-pocket approach to actually terminate atrial fibrillation. Um, so if you go into AFib once a year and it sustains, uh, there is a pill that we could give you to take at home uh, that would convert you back to a normal rhythm. Um, obviously, if you're having a lot of AFib and are going into AFib every 10 minutes, then that's not a, an appropriate approach. But for rare episodes of AFib, I'm not sure that we need to, to do a surgical or catheter-based treatment or more extensive treatment. Um, so there are treatments that are available for an as-needed basis.
blood thinning agents. Um, I hate Coumadin, you hate Coumadin, we all hate Coumadin, but unfortunately, uh, Coumadin and a new drug called Pradaxa are probably the best agents to prevent atrial fibrillation. Um, unfortunately, aspirin doesn't work as well as Coumadin, and aspirin and Plavix don't work as well as Coumadin. There is a new kit on the block called Pradaxa. Uh, Pradaxa is a wonderful agent. It's whether you're a four foot, 80 pound woman or a six foot, 400 pound guy, the dose is one tablet twice a day. Uh, and you don't need to have blood levels drawn to, to adjust the dosage of it. Uh, there are a couple of problems with Pradaxa. One is because it's a new kid on the block, it doesn't interact with green leafy vegetables or alcohol or all the dietary issues you have with Coumadin. Um, it's a lot more expensive. It's about $250 a month as compared to probably $30 with Coumadin. The other problem is, is is it's renally cleared, so if you've got bad kidneys, uh, you really can't use Pradax. And the third problem is, is unlike Coumadin, which can be reversed with vitamin K or blood plasma if you're in an auto accident uh, or uh, a trauma, uh, Pradaxa really can't be reversed short of hemodialysis, kidney dialysis, uh, which can be done, but it's uh, a little bit difficult to do. So really the two issues are price and reversibility. There are some other treatment options open to you. Um, this is a um, picture of the left atrium and that big nose looking thing is called the left atrial appendage. When you're in a normal rhythm, it sits there and squeezes. When you're in atrial fibrillation, it sits there and quivers, and when it quivers, uh, clots form. It appears that the left atrial appendage is the source of clots and stroke uh, in atrial fibrillation. Now, one of the tr non blood thinner treatment options to eliminate the risk of stroke is to surgically close that left atrial appendage at the time of open heart surgery. There's another way to close it and that's this device called a watchman uh, and we were one of the watchman centers uh, and what we do is we put this device in the left atrial appendage uh, the body encases it in scar tissue and essentially seals off that left atrial appendage. Uh, the Watchman hopefully will be market released uh, in 2013 uh, and this would be a reasonable uh, alternative to Coumadin and um, Dabigatrin. Um, the only downside about it is, is um, it does require a catheter procedure to implant for people that are having recurrent infections, it's probably not a good choice. Uh, but closing the atrial appendage with a device called the Watchman may be a hope in a couple years of eliminating the need for Coumadin and other anticoagulants. Now, let's talk about pharmacologic treatment for uh, atrial fibrillation. And uh, I like to use analogies to explain things. And, and think of yourself as a elementary school principal on an eight-lane highway leading between Los Angeles and San Diego. Atrial fibrillation is a million cars streaming past your playground all at once. And all the parents calling you up and saying, what are you going to do about Johnny and Susie next to this super highway? Well, you as the principal have one of two options open to you. One option would be in the middle of the night, go one mile upstream towards Los Angeles and put a one-lane tunnel on that eight-lane highway. That would be what I call the tunnel drugs. And they're beta blockers, and some of the names of them are Inderol, Corgard, Toprol, and Metoprolol. The calcium channel blockers, Cardizem, Kalin, Verapamil, and Diltiazem, and Digoxin. Um, the other names are Linoxin and Digitec. These drugs work to slow the impulse from the atrium down to the ventricle. Remember I said in atrial fibrillation, the top chamber is going at 350 beats a minute, but what you feel is the bottom beating at 70, 80, 100, 120 beats a minute. What this does is it slows down atrial fibrillation. It does not prevent atrial fibrillation, does not terminate atrial fibrillation. I can't tell you how many people that I see who come up to me and said, my doctor put me on a beta blocker or calcium channel blocker and I still have AFib. Well, no kidding, because it works at the AV node, it doesn't work up in the atrium where atrial fibrillation originates from. 
The other approach is that you can go up to Los Angeles and meet with each of the employers and get them to stagger their employee discharges. So the company A lets out at 1 o'clock, company B at 1.30, company C at 2 o'clock. And these are drugs that actually work in the atrium and they're, the names of them are quinidine, uh, disopyramide or norpace, procaine or procainamide, rhythmol, which is also called propafenone, tambacor, which is also called flecainide, betapase, which is also called sotalol, ticosin, which is also called defetilide, and cordarone, which is also called uh, amiodarone or pacerone. Um, and finally, maltac, which is also called dronidarone. These drugs actually work up in the atrium. They help prevent AFib. They help terminate AFib. Unfortunately, um, these drugs don't work all that often. The success rate of these drugs range between 30 and 40 percent. But if you have a non-life-threatening disease and it converts you from AFib occurring several times a day to once every six months or a year, I'm not so certain that that's a terrible failure. We'd like the drugs to absolutely prevent atrial fibrillation and to keep it from absolutely happening. But if that happened, myself and Dr. McCarty would be out of a job. Um, so they do a reasonable job. Uh, if they work, terrific. Um, if, and again, with a less than life-threatening rhythm, if we can make it infrequent and tolerable, that's not such a bad result. Pacemakers to prevent AFib. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we would have loved to have had pacemakers prevent AFib. What a pacemaker does is prevent the heart from going too slow. In patients with a really slow heart rate of 30 and 40, by pacing the top chamber, you can sometimes prevent atrial fibrillation. Unfortunately, that's the best it can do. Um, in people with heart rates of 60 and 70, a pacemaker will not prevent atrial fibrillation. Your doctor may suggest a pacemaker for several reasons. One is, is frequently when you go from atrial fibrillation to a normal rhythm, you may have a long pause um, where the heart stops beating and you may get lightheaded. And that may be an indication for a pacemaker. Another reason that we sometimes put in pacemakers for atrial fibrillation is if your heart rate's really fast and we need to put you on increasing doses of medicine to slow the heart rate down. Um, but unfortunately, as much as we would have loved, a pacemaker will not cure atrial fibrillation. It just allows your physician to treat it a little bit better to make it a little bit less symptomatic. But it, in general, it's non-curative. There's a single connection between the top and bottom chamber, and it's located on that slide where it says compact AV node and his bundle. That's the single connection between the top chamber and the bottom chamber. Now, there is a procedure that can be done called an AV node ablation, and what we do is we put a catheter up next to that, that structure, and we cauterize that structure. We disconnect the top and bottom chamber. At that point, your top chamber is still beating at 350, but the bottom chamber is beating at zero. Now, obviously, you don't survive with a heart rate of zero. What we do is we put in a pacemaker, but from that point on, your heart rate's 72 beats a minute forever and ever and ever, and it feels rock regular, and to you, it feels like you're in a normal rhythm. Unfortunately, um, it's, you're not in a normal rhythm, and we've traded one disease for another. We've traded AFib with a very rapid response for AFib with a very slow response. Again, you may feel like you're back in a normal rhythm, but because the top chamber's still out of rhythm, you'll still need to be on the Coumadin and or Pradaxa. So um, we generally reserve this for people that are real sick with really bad lung disease who don't have other good options. Um, this, uh, this approach to treat AFib is becoming less and less used as we have more direct curative treatments. It's important to realize that atrial fibrillation is not a single disease. It's really a spectrum of disease. There are three stages of atrial fibrillation. One is paroxysmal, which means that it's coming and going on its own without the need of medication. There's persistent, which means that 
Um, you're going in and out of AFib, but on medication, for the most part, you're staying in, uh, um, can be kept in, in a normal rhythm. And chronic, which means that you're in a atrial fibrillation all the time. Um, and it's with great pleasure at this point to, that I introduce Kevin McCotty. He's going to talk about catheter cures for atrial fibrillation, which I think is probably one of the most exciting things that we're currently doing. Thank you.